Territory. Got it. I would like to begin by acknowledging that we're in the Robinson Huron Treaty Territory and that the land that we are gathered on is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, specifically the Garden River and Batchewana First Nations, as well as Metis people. The Sioux Climate Hub is a nonpartisan group of concerned citizens advancing climate change mitigation and adaptation to align Sault Ste. Marie with scientific, aspirational and global targets for greenhouse gas emission reductions. We aim to do this through education, engagement and action. The hub is part of the Climate Reality Project Canada that serves as the Canadian component of a global movement of more than 21,000 diverse and dedicated volunteers from 154 countries around the world. If you're interested in following our activities or joining the hub as a volunteer, you can find us on Facebook, and Instagram, or you can email us at suclimatehub at gmail.com. Tonight's webinar presentation title is Home Renewable Energy Retrofitting Options, and we're happy to welcome Bill Egertson, President of Net Zero Plus Canada, this evening. Bill has worked in the renewable energy sector since 1985, including roles with solar, wind, and geothermal industry associations. He was trained by Al Gore in 2008 while he managed the Climate Security Initiative for the UK government. He was selected as an Olympic torchbearer in 2010 to recognize his work, and he re renovated his former residence into the top 20 of energy efficient homes in Canada. Now he's the president of Net Zero Plus Canada, an association that promotes transparency in the energy and emissions space. We're really looking forward to your presentation. Uh, welcome, Bill. Thank you so much, Paul, and good evening, everyone. Problem with virtual meetings is you don't get the sense of the excitement and the, the animation of the people. So I'm gonna have to pretend you're all sitting there on the edge of your seats waiting to hear hopefully what you will consider to be words of wisdom. Uh, yes, so Paul, thank you very much. Um, my discussion tonight will be on energy and Energy is a part of the environment. I'm not going to talk about trees. I'm not going to talk about all of the sustainable issues. Um, I have dealt with energy largely because you can quantify energy. You can figure out how much is being used, what its impact is. You know, I tend to say, stay away from the soft, soft areas like environmental stuff. Very important. A lot of good people are doing a lot of good work, but tonight is going to be purely on energy. And I always start off with a slide to talk about what is called, as soon as I can find it, there we go, um, is the rule of 3C. You've probably heard of this in other, other um, formats, but it's literally conserve. Stop wasting energy, you dummy. Turn the lights off if your room is empty. Close the windows. Shout at your kids to close the doors. Patch the leaks that you find. Uh, it also includes technology, such as a programmable thermostat that you, you don't use energy that you don't need when you don't need it. The second C is convert. Again, check your house. Do any of you have any incandescent light bulbs in your house? Uh, the next question would be why? Check your energy rating. Buy things that are extremely good. Electric vehicles. If you must drive, use an electric or buy, purchase an electric vehicle. And then the third C is after you have conserved and cut back, after you have converted and made the efficiency as most possible, use clean energy. That is, is going to be a focus of what I'm talking about tonight. And now that I can't figure out how to get the silly slides down here, I'm going to scroll. My apologies. few concepts. I'm going to go very quickly over um, that you should understand. I'm going to, this section is going to be very brief and very superficial, but I find that people who care about energy or the environment need to understand some of the underlying issues with energy in the environment. I will assume that you all know the difference between demand and supply, that you know the difference between primary versus secondary energy. Uh, one of my pet peeves is the fact that energy, when anybody talks about energy, they're talking about electricity. Electricity is about 25% of energy. So the two are very distinct. Electricity is a carrier. It is not a source of energy. The wind turbine or the solar panel or the, the coal generating plant, that's the source. Electricity is the carrier. Energy is the very large operation. 
Capacity is another issue that many people don't understand. Output is the kilowatt hour. Capacity is the kilowatt. So if you have a solar panel, for instance, the capacity factor is 5% in most of Canada. That means for a thousand watt panel over the year, 5% or 50 kilowatt hours is all the electricity that you're getting from that, that solar panel. Wind is better, it's about 25%. The further south you go, in the United States, for instance, solar is 25%. So you need, need to know when people say, I'm putting in a thousand watts of, or 10,000 watts of X, okay, what is the X that you're putting in? Because that's not the amount of power energy that you are producing from there. Uh, another term, centralized versus decentralized. Again, decentralized is something that is on your house, for instance. Centralized is something at a large wind farm, solar plant, central plant. And dispatchable versus baseload is whether or not the energy, when you flip the switch, if the lights come on, you are using a dispatchable energy. Or <laughs> Sorry, if you are using a dispatchable energy that is not being dispatched, it won't work. For instance, if your light switch works on solar panels, you may find yourself in the dark a lot because that is a non-dispatchable energy. You need a battery to go with it. So again, these are common misconceptions or misperceptions that many people have. What I'd love to do is to show people this chart. All of these terms are energy. They are various forms of energy. Um, and I bet that most of you looking at this will know what two, three, maybe four or five of them are. Um, the Net Zero Plus Canada Association, one of our goals is to stop using terminology like this, focus on kilowatt hour. If our country, if our economy, if our world is going to electrify, call it kilowatt hour. That way we are all consistent. Uh, we, we get to compare. So that are you buying a 60,000 BTU grill or a 5,000 kilowatt hour solar panel? You know, are they the same amount of energy that you're getting out of that? I've had to face this most of my career. The very bottom one, ton of cooling capacity, is how the geothermal heat pump people talk about their capacity. And it drives me crazy. I used to scream, no consumer understands what a ton of cooling capacity is, but they still continue to use that. So a lot of terms here are very relevant. They are used, the BTU. I always love asking people, do you know what a British thermal unit is? It is the heat emitted from the striking of a hardwood match. Okay, you know, so a 60,000 BTU grill or whatever is like striking 60,000 matches simultaneously. We want consistency so that people can understand what it is that they're using and how it is they're using it. Another slide, if we're gonna talk about renewable energy, we need to look at all the adjectives that are used there. Alternative, clean, sustainable, blah, blah, blah. Um, there's a lot of greenwashing. You need to know what is meant by renewable, what is meant by all of these terms on this chart because that has a true impact on climate change and the emissions. Some of these are good terms, some of them, well, sorry, they are all good terms, but some of them actually mean something. So the trick is to find out which are the ones that you care about and go for that. Um, sorry, and one final slide. If we're talking about renewable energy, which we will be tonight, there is more than just wind and solar. There is solar PV, Solar thermal is the, when I started with the Solar Industries Association, solar thermal was the big one in solar because those were the, that was the tank that heated the water that heated your swimming pool. It did car washes, it did a whole lot of stuff like that. It was not photovoltaic, it was thermal. Uh, wind can be mechanical or electrical. You probably remember that Holland and the Southern United States, wind turbines there were used for pumping water for many, many, many years before we, Thomas Edison figured out how to plug in the light bulb. Now they are mostly electric. Hydro, you've got run of river, which is where the water is flowing down the stream. It runs through a turbine, it's not dammed, or the majority of our electricity from hydraulic, and Canada is 60% hydroelectricity, um, they, they dam it. The downside there, the upside is that you have then got the power ready to flow through the turbine when you need it. It becomes dispatchable. The downside is, as Quebec found out with LG2, it releases a very large amount of methane, which is a high global warming coefficient. Uh, so when you dam it, if you haven't taken the proper precautions to, pr to prepare the land for it, you can get into problems. Some of the other terms, tidal, wave, ocean thermal electric conversion, Passive solar, biomass, I mean, it wasn't that long ago, everybody had a wood stove. Now, a lot of people have wood stoves, but biomass is still a very common technology. 
or a source of energy. Geothermal, this is where you drill down into a pocket of hot water and that drives a turbine. My specialty and my focus tonight is gonna to be on ground source heat pumps. There's also air source heat pump. And then as you go down the list, hybridization drain water is uh, a way that used to be very popular. Again, when I got into the, into the business, you would put a, to oversimplify, there was a pipe that you could put around your exhaust drain from your house before it went into the sewer or your septic. And it transferred the heat from your shower water and your dishwasher and whatever else was hot water. And basically save that heat, heated up more water so that you could run another load of, of laundry or something like that. Ethanol, energy from waste, municipal solid waste, those are all sources of energy. And if you have to burn garbage to generate electricity or create thermal heat, hey, that's great. Renewable natural gas, I won't comment on because I don't think it's really a, a fair technology. Cogeneration. And the final line of hydrogen and batteries, you have to be careful that these are not energy sources. This is how you store the energy so that as you are generating the electricity, they go into either hydrogen or battery. So if somebody says, I'm zero carbon because I'm using hydrogen, you have to ask, what is the source of the hydrogen that you're using? And back to this, where is the silly cursor going? So a couple of comments that I want to make in terms of constraints, you have to worry about peak uh, and seasonal. If you've got a solar panel, uh, an example, we were one of the first houses in Eastern Canada, Eastern Ontario to install the microfit system many years ago, 80 cents a kilowatt hour. My solar panels between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. on winter and 5 p.m., 7 p.m., which are the two peak periods, those solar panels generated no electricity. The, the silicon had not been activated. There wasn't enough sun. So again, that's a, a peak issue. I was not contributing anything to peak, but I still got the 80 cents for the stuff I did at noon. Seasonal, obviously, sometimes you, you get more energy when the sun is out, when it's not. You get into zoning issues with municipalities. Many people are not allowed to put up wind turbines if they're in an airline landing craft zone. Birds are an issue. We can go back to maintenance, preparation, I will be mentioning my house uh, a number of times later on, but the house had asphalt shingles. I was installing the microfit solar system and we basically stripped off the asphalt and put on a metal roof, A, because yeah, the asphalt was starting to deteriorate. Secondly, it decreased the heat load on the solar panels, so the efficiency was greater. I was generating a couple of more kilowatt hours per day. And also, if the asphalt had stayed there, the asphalt continues to degrade. At some point, I'm gonna to have to take off the solar system, replace the roof shingles, and then put the solar system back on. So try to think through this, and we'll touch on this in a holistic approach later on. Try to think through what will, what is the next step, and should you take two steps at once or just one step as you do this? You have to worry about repairing, end of life, recycling, the big debate right now with wind turbine blades and solar panels. How do they get recycled? Question mark, question mark. Another issue is conflicting goals um, in terms of urbanization. Should we all, are we entitled to have a backyard where I can put my solar panels or should there be an apartment building in my backyard because we need the higher urban density? If we need roads because we all have electric vehicles, we still need the asphalt, the bitumen to make the roads so that we can drive on those roads. Um, interesting case I was involved with here in Ottawa there's an experimental farm. The National Research Council has an experimental farm. There was a big uh, apartment building zoned for next to the farm. The environmentalists were upset because this farm was going to block some of the uh, two or three acres of research. And they said, no, you can't shade that. The apartment building was next to a light rapid transit station. So I had a bit of a personal issue there. If indeed we care about rapid transit and we want to put a high rise apartment building, to me, the answer was move the stupid research acreage to the other side of the farm. But you get into a lot of these type of, of issues as you, as you get into the environmental sector. I'd like to go back and show a couple of slides here again. Sorry, I uh, shouldn't have closed that tab. I want to talk about how do we use energy. In 2020, there are, well, there are five sectors of our economy, residential, commercial, and as you can see there. I use, and part of what um, Net Zero Plus Canada is trying to do under its standardization is stop using terms like megawatts and gigawatts and terawatts and other watts, call it kilowatt hours. 
people don't know what it is, but they are comfortable with the term kilowatt hours. So I use billion kilowatt hours on everything. Get it down to what you, the person, can understand. Here's a quick chart to show you based on national research, or sorry, um, NRCAN data. This is how much energy is consumed by those five sectors. And you can see that industry is the, the big pig in terms of both energy consumption and emissions. Residential, hey, we're pretty significant. The total amount of energy consumed each year is that big number down at the bottom, which is 2.5 billion, sorry, trillion, 2.5 trillion um, kilowatt hours per year. And we emit 455 megatons or billion kilotons, depending on how you want to term it, of emissions as a result of our energy use. So that's the target of what we're trying to get across. This is going to make sense in a couple of seconds when we moved into it, but the same chart with the same numbers, if you disaggregate thermal load in a house and a commercial building, thermal being space heating, space cooling, and water heating versus lights and appliances, which I'll refer to as plug load, that shows you the amount of energy that is used in those various sectors. And if you do the quick math, that is you know, a significant amount of, of energy that is used for thermal applications. So as we get into this, if you are serious about trying to do something, rather than change your, just change your light bulbs in your house, think about the thermal stuff. And that is the, going to be the focus of, of the discussion that we have tonight. Also, quick background, here's electricity in Canada. In 2022, it was 640 billion kilowatt hours. Um, hydraulic, hydro, combustible, nuclear. Ontario is about 60% nuclear. So we're clean. If you like nuclear, it's great. If you take that 640 billion and you compare it to the 2,500 billion that I showed you in the previous slide, 25% of energy consumed in Canada is through electricity. So we're still at just 25%. Electricity is not the be all and the end all. It's growing as we electrify, but it is still only 25%. If you take the solar, which is 0.5% of the electricity generated in Canada, if you spread that over all energy, that means solar PV provides 0.1% of the energy in Canada. So we've got a, a lot of room to go there, but I just want people to be aware of the fact that it's not an overpowering technology. It has huge potential, but when you look at the competition, there's only 99.9% .9 of, of the rest of the market that has to be taken over from this. 80% of our, our electricity is non-carbon. Most of our electricity is dispatchable, hydraulic. Again, um, Manitoba Hydro is a good example where they stop their water flowing through their dams at night. They buy cheap coal generated and now gas generated electricity from North Dakota. And at seven o'clock in the morning, they open the sluice gates on their dams and sell the hydroelectric green power to North Dakota at an inflated, or sorry, an, a very high price because it's, it's clean, it's got no carbon content. And it's a beautiful policy of ripping off the Americans you know, with, with our resources. So now I want to move into the basis of what it is we're here tonight, is your house. Federal data show that there are roughly 15 million households in Canada. A household is a living dwelling. Whether you're a huge suburban McMansion, whether you're a very small apartment in a high rise, there are 15 million discrete living arrangements in Canada. Roughly 2,000 million square meters, I convert to square feet, 23, um, 23 and a half million square feet of living space just houses. That makes the average of 147 square meters, or if you're more, more uh, familiar with feet, 1,580 square feet is the average house. I do this so that you should know what the size of your house is. As we deal with these data, you will know whether you are cleaner or dirtier than what the national average is. So going through this chart very quickly, petajoules I've converted to billion kilowatt hours, then per household, so that the brown line Per household, you are using 26,583 kilowatt hours per year. If you are an average size house with average um, energy consumption and you are all electric, for instance, your meter at the end of the year should say 26,000. Per square meter, that's 181 kilowatt hours per square meter of floor space. And again, for those in feet, 
for every square feet, it's 16, almost 17 kilowatt hours per square foot, multiplied by whatever the size of your place is. The green line is what the thermal is. So again, space heating, water heating, and space cooling. That's how much you use, and that's how much is emitted, so that you can see that it's roughly 82% of your house energy use is for thermal applications, those three applications that leaves 18% for your fridge, stove, refrigerator, beer fridge, second beer fridge, and third beer fridge. Um, it's significant, but not overwhelming. If you want to actually have an impact, worry about the thermal load. And in terms of megatons, that's the number of kilograms per household that is emitted per square meter per square foot. I translated it into pounds per square feet. Um, and 5.3 pounds per square foot is the dirtiness of the average house. I used to use this, um, the house that I had, which was one of the top 20 in the country, used to do tours. I would get a 12 by 12 floor tile, put on a five pound bag of icing sugar, say, I wish it were black because this is the amount of carbon that, my house, that the average house would be emitting per year per square foot. So you multiply it by 5.3, that's how much carbon you are putting out. 4.6 of that, or 86%, is from the thermal applications. And just so that you understand how that breaks down in terms of the applications, space heating is the biggie, water heating is the next biggie, space cooling, small but getting up there, and it's cleaner than most because almost all space cooling is electric, where space heating is and water heating are frequently gas-fired or whatever. And the lights and appliances down there shows you what your, your lights and appliances, your plug load, as I call it, is talking about. So the, the space cooling is small but growing, and you know there's, there's potential to do work there. In the commercial sector, again, did the same graph, shows what happens in terms of kilowatt hours per square meter and kilograms per square meter of every commercial institutional building. And the two lines or the two sections there, national secondary energy consumption is 2,500 billion kilowatt hours. If you take just residential and commercial institutional thermal applications, that's 550 or 25%, tw sorry, 20% 20 of our national energy is used for heating homes and offices. For carbon, it's 455 billion kilograms um, in terms of emissions and the thermal applications is 87. So it's slightly lower. That's because the commercial buildings frequently use electricity more so than gas, so they're not as, I'll use the term, bad. And the final graph, so that we can get into the discussion about renovations, I told you before, I'm totally biased for ground source heat pumps. That was the basis of my last house that scored very high. I ran the industry associations for 15 years. Uh, you know, I know a, almost a fair amount about a heat pump. What Net Zero Plus Canada was set up to do is to show that before you put in a heat pump, you are producing no kilowatt hours, but you are consuming the 21.7 and the plug load four, and your CO2 is 3,300 and your plug load emissions, which is your source electricity. So you blame that on Ontario Hydro for having dirty electricity. You are responsible for 523 kilograms. If you put in a heat pump, that heat pump produces 21,714 from the ground, literally, um, and if, if you don't understand how a ground source heat pump works, I can get into that later on, but it will produce all of that energy. It will require 6,000 for consumption of the compressor and the distribution and the pumping, blah, 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 all of that stuff. You still have the same load. Your CO2 emissions drop precipitously. So the bottom two lines are the key to the uh, Net Zero Plus Canada's argument. The kilowatt hour production, 21.7, total consumption, 11, that's a two to one ratio. That is net zero plus. And this uh, carbon emissions, the 3,800 kilograms drops to 1,200. So it's a three to one ratio, depending on how you want to do that. Again, the net zero plus heat pump is net zero plus. And all of the energy from the heat pump is dispatchable. So again, you turn it on at any time. In my house, 93% of my electricity, which meant energy in my house because it was an all electric house, 93% was used in off peak period. The local distribution utility could not understand it, thought I was jerking around with the data. I said, no, 
I don't use energy and I work from home. So I had to boil the kettle, you know, run the computer, blah, blah, blah. But that is the impact of what a heat pump can do for, for that um, application. That is my final blurb about that. Now we will talk about grants. So obviously a lot of you are interested in getting more information on grants. They exist at the federal level, they exist at the provincial level, and frequently at the utility, sorry, utility level. I'm not familiar with what Sault Ste. Marie does, but you know, they change, they fluctuate. Um, there's a rumor that Hydro-Quebec in Quebec is about to give a $30,000 incentive for a ground source heat pump, which would be absolutely insane. And we're trying to oppose that because that is far more than, than what it should be, but that's another issue. So on grants, you have to determine who is giving it, why are they giving it? I mean, what's, what's the incentive for the Ontario government to give an incentive when Ontario PowerGen and your local distribution utility make a lot of money from you wasting energy? You know, it's in their best interest for you to be pigs because they are going to make money from you. So why are they trying to cut back? Is there a clear goal and as I preambled with the, the discussion, you know, is it an actual reduction or is it a pseudo reduction that, hey, yeah, you know, I'm recycling a paper towel this afternoon, so that makes me net zero. Or I put up a solar panel on my 50,000 kilowatt hour gas plant, so I must be net zero, right? I've got solar and I've got gas. Um, you know, do the math. So why are they giving grants? Um, every grant that goes out, part of the issue is your taxes have to go up to compensate for that. And yes, everybody pays more taxes. You, the good person, um, you know, should pay less taxes. The complex, the application process is usually very complex, very convoluted, very, oh my God, a lot of people have trouble understanding it, including contractors. Uh, frequently, the money is not given out till post-installation, so there's a cash flow problem for you. There's uncertainty, you go ahead. Are you guaranteed that incentive for that grant or is it, you know, if you actually achieve the goals that you are supposed to achieve? Uh, and then the big fear for, for me, I came into the industry with ground source after the Ontario government had given a $2,000 rebate. Um, the program was an absolute abysmal mess. It messed up the industry badly. There were systems that were installed without loops in the ground. You know, there was no oversight but we also did an analysis post hoc. It was a $2,000 rebate. And as much as we could ascertain, the price had gone up by $1,500. So the dealers, my members made money. Thank you, thank you very much, Ontario Hydro. But the consumer didn't really save a lot. We've always encouraged people since then that if you ever are seriously considering an, um, an installation of wind, solar, biomass, ground source, air source, whatever, without annoying the industry contractor, get a quote now. When the rebate comes out, if it's a $5,000 rebate and your price from yesterday goes up $4,900, you know, you're not paying that increase because you're getting a rebate, but the, the dealer is making an extra $4,900. Because I have represented the dealers for most of my career, I think that is good. The dealers have to make money. But again, grants can be a little bit of a, you know, a hidden lining there. So be very careful. To prepare for the audit, here's what you need to know, that there will be a pre-inspection and there will be a post-inspection. So you need to find your starting point, how bad you are. And once you're finished, how good you are. Frequently, the grant is based on the incremental goodness that you have paid for to install in your house. Um, an inspection, an audit is not that onerous. The charge I always get is, Part of what they do is a blower door test. And if you're not aware of what that is, it's a machine that goes on your front door and it blows the air out. And the number of people I've had say, but I can't stay inside, I'll suffocate. It's not quite like that, but it, you know, yeah, they're making a negative pressure inside the house so that they know they're putting out X CFM of air and their computer says, I'm putting out hundred CFM, but 99 is leaking in. So you've got a really badly insulated house they walk around with a smoke gun or various things and you go near windows and if the, you know, it's basically a plume of smoke. So you're polluting the environment, but you know, the smoke goes up and if the wind from the pressure, you know, because it's creating a bit of velocity here, blows the wind, the contractor says, problem there. Um, the other way of doing it is you can go to the library or buy one of these things, Black & Decker thermal leak detector. 
very, I think I paid 35 bucks for it, something like that. It's a gun that you, you aim at something like, how do I do this? There we go. You aim at that temperature, that's 22.9 degrees. And then I go around my house to windows and if it drops to 19.7, 18.3, I know that that's got a leak, fix the leak. The other thing that libraries do, certainly here in, in Mississippi Mills in Ottawa, is called a kilowatt meter. And they're again, 15, 20 bucks, something like that from Amazon. You plug it in, you then plug in something, whether it's your TV or something that's on a lot that you think is draining power. Without getting into complex discussions, there's a button that says over seven days, this device, this TV consumed this much energy. It's beautiful for standby power so that you turn your TV off at night, plug it into here, go to bed. The next time you turn your TV on tomorrow night, you will see 750,000 kilowatt hours. Okay, so your standby draw is a little bit more than what you should be using. Uh, you know, get a new TV or unplug your TV or, or, or. There are quite a few options. But little devices, toys, gimmicks, technology. Men love it. Women, not so much. My wife never really got into it, but... That, hey, that's that's that. Um, so you can get those, as I say, from the library or they're fairly cheap. I don't like to say this, but if you are seriously considering getting an audit, don't do an awful lot of fixing up before you do the audit, the, the pre-audit, simply because you are then evaluated at your worst possible condition and you do the audit, post-audit, it's a greater increment. So you get a greater grant. If you go around and close windows and doors and, and seal up stuff, you know, you should do this anyways, but, yeah, and you certainly do it if you're not doing an audit. But if you're doing an audit, maximize your return. You know, your house leaks. I'm not suggesting you go around and punch holes in your basement wall so that you've got huge leakage that you know how to patch up. But, you know, just do the best that you can in that area. The final point I want to make is on a holistic approach. Again, this one with my last house, um, the owner, the previous owners had heated with propane because it was out in the country, blah, blah, blah. Uh, she went through about three of the very large tanks each year of, of propane. When I did the housing inspection, um, the attic was accessible only from the outside. My contractor was up there. We were using two-way radios. Bill, you've got no insulation in your attic. Would you shut up and get to work? You know, I'm paying you for this job. Stop jerking around. He said, come up to the attic. They had forgot to insulate the attic. So the, the owner had passed. His widow, who suffered from cancer, was living there, paying a fortune in propane to heat this house. Long story, you know, we, we said, hey, you've got no insulation in the attic. Uh, so I think it was 3000 bucks, something like that. She, she dropped the price. We just took the, the, um, the gun with the insulation and blew $3,000 worth of insulation in up there. But we kept one of the tanks partly because we kept it for cooking and we installed a very efficient heat recovery ventilator in the living room, in the family room on a fireplace. Had there been another ice storm, I had enough electric battery power and solar panels and wind turbines that I could have run that HRV so the propane would have been used to heat the family room and the air circulator would have circulated the air. The house would have survived. We wouldn't have frozen to death for a period of time. We never had to experiment with that. But always think through those little angles that, uh, you know, make sure that you're not exposing yourself to some type of jeopardy if something goes wrong. Um, our house, just to give you an idea, I love saying this, Adam, we replaced all the windows with triple pane, double low E coated, Krypton gas-filled windows. Our, our value of our windows was higher than most people's walls. So that gives you some idea of, of how I, and, and the ground source heat pump was one of the major factors. Um, I oversized it and anybody who cares about the term oversizing, I will explain that in the questions. But yeah, we had stuff for um, emergency 12 volt backup, things like that. If you can, if you're in the country and there's a risk that you're gonna be dropped from the grid, you know, there are a large number of things you could do like if, as I say, if you're on propane, keep one of the propane or keep a propane tank or a gas generator or, or, or quite a few areas. So just think of it in a holistic, a holistic approach if you're talking a reno. So Paul, I want to stop talking now and let the questions roll. Bill, Bill Alan Frederick here. A lot of good information, but as, a, as a, an average consumer, 
how in the heck do I make a business case out of some of this stuff? Like, what's the simple way to, for me to make a business case? I can listen to the energy auditor or the or the salesman who's coming out to my house to sell me the ground source or the air source heat pump. Like, is, is there a simple way to make a, a business case out of this? Two points. Um, go through your last 12 months of energy bills, whether it's electricity or gas or however you heat your house. How much did you pay for energy and how many kilowatt hours, cubic meters of natural gas convert the cubic meters? Um, what would you be paying and using if you were to install, again, air source, ground source, wood stove, whatever it is. I mean, if you buy a wood stove, you have to buy wood unless you've got a whole lot of wood on your property. But then you get into the debate, you're releasing carbon, you're stopping the sequestration of the tree, you're chopping down the tree and you're burning. I mean, you can get into an interminable debate here, navel gazing, but to do a business case, are you doing it purely to save money or to make money? As I did with my, we were the first um, microfit system in Eastern Ontario, as I mentioned, I got paid 80 cents a kilowatt hour. That was an insanely stupid rate. I mean, there's no way OPG should have been paying me 80 cents a kilowatt hour, but they needed early adopters. And I was, you know, I jumped in. So my solar panels were paid for in about, I think it was three and a half, four years, you know, at that exorbitant rate. And they'll never do that again, because right now you can't really get a, a fit grant or a microfit grant. It's now net zero or sorry, um, net metering. So if you use 100 kilowatts of grid power, and you are generating 100 kilowatts of your power from the solar panels, you net it out. And you know if you paid, if you used 101 of the grid, you have to pay them for one kilowatt hour. Business case, if you're talking purely money, I will be very honest, it's difficult. Commercial is a different case, but a homeowner to do the amount of work necessary, assuming you've got an average leaky house that's got bad windows, you know, crummy attic insulation, whatever, to actually make money is, very difficult to save money. Again, we emphasize cost versus investment. How long are you going to stay in that house? The average resident in Canada stays in their apartment, in their household. So I'm talking both homeowners and apartment renters like students. It's 4.1 years on average. All Canadians combined, that's the average tenure in a household before you switch, go back to your parents, whatever, if you're a student, you know, if you're only there for four years, wow, I would be very difficult to, to get a business case on that. If you intend to stay there for the rest of your life and you retire to it and you are paying large amounts of money, and then you add the interminable, how much carbon tax do you avoid? Um, you know, how much better do you feel about yourself because you're not emitting as much as those horrible neighbors that you've got? You know, we all love to TikTok or tush tush, whatever the term is, you know, our bad neighbors, you know, that's not a business plan, but it is an ego plan. But yeah, I would be hard pressed to, if somebody said, I want to save money or make money by renovating my house, that is a difficult proposition. Okay, thank you. I, 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 I think you've answered my question. And I, I mean, I, 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 I've tried to do the business case myself, but there's so many variables that come into play. And a lot of it, as you say, is, is after the fact. You know, you're comparing it, stop information after the fact. And if you're a residential customer, electric heat, you know, weather has such a big implication. And then you say, what the heck's my payback period? Maybe it's five to 10 years. I don't know. Is that reasonable? I don't know. And what is reasonable to you, Alan? Five years, six years, 10 years, 12 years? I mean, a, a month and a half? Yeah, you have to be a bit realistic here, but you're right. Um, and unfortunately, an um, energy audit is about 600 bucks. So if you do a program, they do the pre, they do the post, and you know the $600 is usually buried in the grant. But I wish there were some way that a homeowner could do a portable blower door test that you just go into your house, you know, plug it in, <clears throat> my house leaks this much. Then you've got a business case. How much, how much work do you need to do? Maybe it's your windows that suck. Maybe your roof is terrible. You forgot to insulate your attic, stuff like that. Uh, your front door leaks like a sieve. So that thermal energy gun is a good one to find leaks. And again, I focus on thermal far more than electrical, but you know, even... Are you wasting electricity? Are you running a whole lot of LED lights all night? They're less energy consumed than incandescent lights, but you're still wasting. Now, again, do you want an outside light because that's hospitable and because your kids are coming home late at night? Yeah, you have to do that. You have to 
quote, waste energy, but uh, there are ways of wasting intelligently. To make money or to save an awful lot of money, everything depends on what your tolerance or your, your comfort level is, Alan. Okay, good. Thank, thanks, Bill. Okay. Thanks, Alan, for those questions. And, and anybody else that wants to ask a question of Bill, please feel free. If you want to put something in the chat to ask him as well, you can do that. Uh, Bill, I, I had a quick one just to start you off there. Maybe could you give us a, a simple explanation of um, the operation of a ground source heat pump? That seems to be the one that you're championing, uh, how it works. I, I gather from what you're saying, it'd be different costs to install in different places, but maybe just a ballpark for the group as well. Ballpark is very difficult because everything depends on how much heat do you need in your house, like how energy efficient are you, and what is your soil. Because a ground source installs pipe through the ground. It picks up the heat, it transfers the heat in your earth into a through a pipe into a fluid that's running through there. The fluid goes back to your compressor. So it's like a refrigerator that takes the heat from your you know, your, your whatever the food is that you've just, the beer. Oh, that's right. It takes the heat from the beer and it runs it through the compressor and blows it out the back of your fridge. That is vert that's more of an air source. A ground source is running through the ground and picking up the heat, or in summer, it takes the heat from your house and rejects that heat into the ground. If you've got high conductivity soil, granite rock is the best, but you, you cannot afford to install in granite rock. But if you've got loamy soil, you know, that sucks. It, it's very poor. So giving a a guideline, the dealers can't do it. I've always shied away from doing that, but it will be expensive on a retrofit. That's part of our campaign now, Net Zero Canada, Net Zero Plus Canada. We have a campaign called 3 Million Homes, which is Canada is committed to three and a half million new homes. A ground source can be installed in a new building at almost the same cost as an air source can be installed in a retrofit. Ground source in a retrofit. I mean, I installed my own ground source at, at my last house and I got a very good deal from dealers. I oversized it. Um, you know, I think my cost was, if I had to add all of the costs, excluding my labor, because it was, I did the work. You know, it was probably about six, $7,000. It should have been about 20. But that's because you have to pay the, the workmen to trench your yard. You're going to mess up your wife's garden. You're going to put the pipe in. You're going to slot it down. And then, you know, the, the earth looks bad. The option is to do vertical drilling, but then you're paying a well driller. And it's the well dr drilling industry that does a lot of this. They punch a hole down X meters, so 100 meters, 200 meters, depending on, again, how much heat you need or two or three um, vertical boreholes. And it runs a pipe down, picks up the heat and comes back in an insulated pipe and drops it into the compressor, which then goes into the building. Again, if you, your brother-in-law is a, a well driller, you can get this done at quite a good cost. If you have to pay rack rate, it can get up there. I always used to have a great, well, a lot of cottage country, uh, certainly during the, the 1980s with the, the Ontario Hydro Grant, a lot of cottages and lakeside properties, they just took the pipe, they threw it in the lake. If it was deep enough, they would circulate it. They pull the heat from the water out. And of course, below the ice level in winter, there is still warmth in that water. So you were still able to extract heat and bring it back into the cottage or the, the lakeside house and heat the house. That was the cheapest way of doing it because you just had to make sure the pipe stayed on the bottom of the ground. Nobody dropped a boat anchor on it. I mean, there were some issues, but you didn't have to do trenching. Um, I always loved lobbying federal bureaucrats to say the second largest site in Canada was visible from most of the bureaucratic offices in Ottawa. It's the Museum of Civilization. That entire, if you've been to, what's it called now? Uh, Museum of Canadian History. If you've ever been there, that entire building is heated and cooled by the Ottawa River. They have put pipes in there, they suck out the heat or put the heat into the river, blah, blah, blah. The entire building is done by a ground source. We lobbied for ages to have a sign outside saying, for public works to say, hey, you know, this is ground source or water source is the, the correct term. And yeah, 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 never happened. So however many millions of people go through that museum every year have no idea that that is a 100% renewable energy uh, conditioned building. So the main uh, renovations that are going on that are related to air source heat pumps rather than ground source heat pumps, I guess. Yeah. And um, from what you know, is that 
Oh, um, and I guess from what Alan was saying, that seems to be something that's being sold now by utility companies or contractors across uh, Canada. I don't like to dump on AirSource um, because AirSource works very well for cooling in summer. It's not as great on water heating. The coefficient of performance or SEER is the level that is, is used for efficiency. The problem with AirSource is because with ground source, the heat source is the ground, is the soil that has got both solar insulation during the summer as well as the magmatic heat that is emanating from the center of the earth. So you always have heat there. With air source, your source of heat is air. So once you get to zero degrees Celsius, eh, you know, your efficiency drops. Once you get to minus 10, you are, you know, you're getting close to an electric baseboard. Um, the cold climate air source heat pumps now are rated to minus 23. But when you get to minus 23, you literally are using one kilowatt hour of electricity to run the compressor to get one kilowatt hour of heat out of the air. So you're not saving money. Anything above minus 23, there's a little bit of saving. The big fear is if you have prolonged minus 23 below, those systems don't work. They're, you know, they're trying to suck heat from air that doesn't exist. So you have to have an electric backup, which is basically baseboard, so you're, you're running, again, a 1.0 1 efficiency rating. We're worried that if everybody in the country were to put in an air source and charge their electric vehicles at the same time, what happens on a cold day to the grid? You know, goodbye, grid. <laughs> Been nice knowing you. So air source works. I'm, I don't mean to dump on it. It's just ground source uh, on new construction, especially, is far, far, far superior. You know, what, a couple more questions. I don't want to monopolize the conversation. Uh, I've got electric uh, water heater, and I, I see now they're going to tankless uh, water heaters. Is, is there a case if your electric electric water heater going to an electric tankless system? Yes, as long as you don't have prolonged showers. You know, ten people in your house doing a back to back. You know. You don't have storage, which means it's tankless, which means as you need the heat, you're heating it and you're using it. So if you're a big pig on hot water, that's a problem. You, you do have to look at your lifestyle and your, you know, your whatever lifestyle approach. Tankless is better because a lot of us have a large water tank, we're heating it, and then we go to bed. So that hot water, I've paid to heat it, used electricity or, or gas, whatever, to heat it. And then it cools to a degree because you always have some loss overnight. And, you know, if I go away for a week, I have heated that water for nothing. And while I'm gone, the stupid thing kicks in again to heat it when it gets cold enough. And there's nobody using the water. Tankless solves that problem. So if you're a, a high user, you know, a good user, it's a very good idea. If you're a big pig user, it's not a great idea because you can't heat that much water. And if you're a non-user, um, it's a better idea than a tank. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Bill. And one more quick question. Do you see any new technologies coming out for the average residential electric heat customer? Do you see any new technologies coming down the road? I'm not aware of any silver bullet coming down, no. Heat. Okay. Air source seems to have captured the, the public imagination, you know, and they are reasonable costs. They do a reasonable job for most units. Uh, and if we are trying to get you off gas, then yes, uh, you know, air source works. If you've got a large property or a new property or you've got a backyard that you can tear apart like I did, ground source is better and the, the payback is, is far superior. But no, I'm not aware of any, you know, magic. No, no new magic technologies coming in. Okay. Not that Thanks. I'm aware of. Thanks, Bill. Okay. Great, thanks, Bill, for those answers. A couple of questions or comments and questions, Bill. Oh, uh, I ha I had took a different approach. You were talking about water heater. I have an electric water heater with a tank, and I didn't want to buy buy a new one, so I put a timer on it, and then yeah. I just heat it at night. Yeah, yeah. That's another <laughs> another approach. Oh, uh, yes. I mean, if you can use your energy in off peak hours unless you're on the, the flat rate, you know, if you can use the, as I say, the Ontario power gen is coming out with an ultra low overnight rate of five cents. When I lived in my last house, I was paying seven cents a kilowatt hour, um, seven cents for the consumption I used overnight. 
I avoided the 14 cent cost during the day, during peak hours. If I could get it at five cents under with that house, yes, I would be doing a lot. But timers, setbacks, the whole thing. This again is your your conserve and your convert issue. Um, you know, you're still using electricity, which here in Ontario is nuclear, and I'm not going to get into a debate whether nuclear is good. It is low carbon, and the Ford government is going to push ahead on more nuclear because yes, the more air source, ground source we install, the more electric water tanks we install, the more electric vehicles we have, we do need more electricity. Solar will help, wind will help. Uh, we're getting close to maxing out on dams in this province, but uh, yeah, we need the power source, but then we go back in the role of 3C to the first. Do we actually need the power? Can you not, new construction, I fought long and hard when I lived in Ottawa and I was on a bunch of advisory committees. The building code was being the official plan, sorry, was being revised. And I lobbied very hard to say the the official plan should say no new house will be built unless it is absolutely superlatively energy efficient. Well, the builders argued against that. It was going to raise the price of a house by $500. The consumers wouldn't pay $500 more for a million dollar house. You know, and it was just such, and the gas industry also lobbied. If you make houses too energy efficient, the people who sell you the energy don't like that because what happens to their market? You know, and we argued, well, we're building three and a half million new homes. That's a market. But I must admit, we're also trying to stop the extension of the gas pipeline by saying, if we're going to electrify at some stage, why don't you do it now and stop the gas pipeline, which is a huge cost that has to be passed along. You know, it, it's a cost that has no return on investment. Uh, well, no, that's not true because we need, everybody has a right to a gas fireplace and damn it, we should install pipeline all across Canada to put this natural God-given fuel in everybody's backyard. Okay. Do you see anything, any, any future for uh, fuel cells in the... Uh, again, fuel cells, what is the source of the, the, the energy? Um, I think any sexy technology, and I shouldn't use that term so derogatorily, anything that is portable, like hydrogen. I mean, yeah, certain things work well with hydrogen. Batteries, they're great as long as you can carry the batteries. Fuel cells are the same thing. If you need isolate, I would never look at fuel cells as a centralized energy source for the city of Toronto. I think that would be probably crazy, but you know, I'm not a fuel cell expert. But yes, uh, fuel cells work Space stations, one of the first practical applications for solar panels were space stations because you've got a whole lot of sunlight up there out of our atmosphere and those solar panels are running all of the spacecraft that we've got there. Uh, very practical applications. So if fuel cells can meet that type of niche on boats or bicycles, I mean, I would never have dreamt that we would have electric bicycles that are powered by a battery. It never occurred to me until I saw it on the market because I'm used to the 12 volt lead acid batteries in my car. Car, that's not going to go on my bike but some smart dude did the frame the battery in the frame okay you know fuel cells again it's an interesting technology it works it's you know how widespread it can it be don't know but i certainly am not opposed to new technologies covering niche markets so bill if i uh read between the lines or maybe you said it directly you're what you're saying is uh reducing energy in a house you know, that sort of three quarters of the energy is thermal is, is heating the house. And so that's the first place to look is reducing the amount of heat that you put into the house yeah. first by insulating by other other methods. Is that? Yeah, very much. If, if you're gone for a week, don't keep your thermostat at 19, set your thermostat to 12 because you don't need that seven degree differential there and you're just wasting money because your house, assuming your house is leaking. Yeah, conserve, 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 close the doors. You know, my parents screamed at me to close the door. Well, you know, I finally figured out that means you want me to close the door. That saves energy. Um, yes, anything you can do to conserve the 82%, which is for heating and water heating, you know, take shorter showers. That's why we've got aerators on our shower heads. That's why your parents scream at us, screamed at us, you know, and I scream at my kids. Um, that is a form of conserving and not wasting. Then you move to the, the converting, which is, yeah, um, whatever is the LED lights. My last house, 
the incandescent never stepped foot in that last house. I used to buy LEDs off eBay from China before they were available in Canada because LEDs made sense and I went 12 volt. So my wife never knew it, but our bathroom in our last house was powered by my 12 volt solar panels that were on outside because I couldn't connect them to the grid. And she didn't know about it for about a year until all of a sudden something went wrong with the batteries and the bathroom light was going down. And she said, what the hell is going on? And I said, I have to admit something, sweetie. You know, I, I put 12 volt electric LED lights in our bathroom. She didn't need to know. The lighting was beautiful. It was my battery storage system that sucked. So I, I was saving energy there. Got one question in the chat here, Bill, back to water heaters. Is it possible to operate tank and tankless water heaters in the same home? Um, my understanding, I'm no expert, that yes, you could have it for, so that, yeah, you'd have to have a shutoff valve somewhere. You didn't want, you wouldn't want to mix the two applications, but if you've got a you know, a commercial car wash as part of your house. Yes, you could have it for the tank and the kids' showers or whatever on the tank list. But I, I want to avoid answering that question because I don't know. Are there more questions in chat? Uh, that's the only one right now. Okay. We're, we're coming up on an hour here and just, uh, I we can have a few more minutes for questions, but before people start signing off, I just want to thank Bill so much for uh, your presentation tonight. Uh, really informative for everybody. And uh, thank everybody that joined us as well. And let everybody know that our, our next webinar is uh, Wednesday, November 29th. Uh, it's going to be an introduction to electric vehicles. And we've got uh, two uh, uh, gentlemen from the uh, Ottawa Electric Vehicle Association that are going to come and present to us on that. So um, we still have uh, a couple minutes. And if anybody has another question they want to ask Bill, please uh, go ahead. Hello, it's Alan Frederick again. Electric heat, I'm Electric Heat customer. And I looked at uh, ceramic, ceramic heaters, you know, where it, where it would store the heat during the night and then emit it during the, the day. But the payback period was like, Five plus years. Yeah. You see, do you see that advancing at all as for electric heat customers? Yes, in the same way that if you were to get the very low rate overnight electricity rate and you had access to a whole lot of batteries, you know, you're in the battery business, I would argue use the five cent rate, charge your batteries all night, basically drop off grid during the day when they're charging you whatever it's up to now, 14, 15 cents, use your batteries. It's the same concept. If you can time shift your load that you're buying, now again, you're from an environmental point of view, um, you are helping because if you buy off peak, that's nuclear. If you buy on peak in Ontario, part of it is gas fired. So you actually are reducing emissions and we shouldn't ignore the emissions factor here. But yeah, if you've got some way of heating up a stone in your living room, with the five cent a, a, a kilowatt hour overnight rate, and it's enough to keep your building going for the rest of the day, it means you're not buying whatever 14 cent kilowatt hour for your baseboard heater or something like that. Yeah, those are the creative types of approaches, Alan, that yeah, how do you time shift? How do you convert? How do you do things that make money sense? Again, always bearing in mind what is your impact on the environmental uh, emissions, but if you can avoid peaking using any electricity in peak means that Ontario needs to burn less natural gas as a peaker. I should mention, I've just entered in the chat a HTML or a, a URL. It's a personal issue of mine. If anybody has interest, go to the caution.world site. It's something that is a, I usually close with a cautionary tale that if we don't stop or if we continue to dramatize the, the role of renewable energy and more solar, more wind, whatever, there is a huge downside risk, but that's, that's where I cover that. Got another question in the chat here, Bill, um, from Carmen. How does one calculate comparison of insulating a basement versus replacing windows and doors, which delivers the greater energy savings? That a contractor could 
could answer you that they would measure how much insula insulation you've got in the basement. And they know that per inch or per centimeter of insulation will decrease your heat loss by that much. They'll be able to do an analysis of your windows to say, okay, you've got single pane leaky glass with a poor frame. If we were to put in triple pane, double low E Krypton gas fill, you know, you will have no more leakage, but that's assuming the rest of your house, the walls are not poor. Um, so a contractor would be able to do that hy hypothetical analysis based on an analysis of what it is you've got, how much would it cost for him to install another five inches of insulation? And he should have a fairly good idea that that will reduce your heat requirement, the amount of energy you have to buy by that much. And he should be able to do the same thing for windows. Windows is a little bit more tricky because it depends on how bad your building is. Insulation in the basement is a slap. I mean, that, that's a no-brainer. Any contractor can tell you that. You installed $500 worth of insulation around here. I can save you $200 a year in, in heating costs. Great, thank you. I have another, another question. question oh. Yeah. I, I don't know if this is an area of expertise that you can answer, Bill, but uh, one of the things looking at trying to go uh, carbon neutral, uh, seems like it's quite difficult unless uh, you use uh, carbon capture and storage. Uh, do you have any comments on that? Like, uh, uh, is that an area that you've looked at or is that not in your area of expertise? My brother was an oil geologist, so I still talk to him, but I did ask him a lot about carbon capture because that's where the majority of carbon capture is stored is in the old drilled natural gas wells. As long as there's no seismic activity, it will stay there. Um, we've got other ways of storing it in various materials. Again, assuming nothing wrong or bad happens to that material, it should store the carbon, but you know, there have got to be better ways of not producing the carbon to start with. Trees, uh, uh, I have a lot of fun with trees, that the average mature broadly deciduous tree sequesters 40 kilograms per year of carbon. So for the 4,000 kilograms that you emit, you need 200 trees, mature trees in your backyard to sequester all of the carbon that you are emitting. Um, that is capture. And so let's assume there is no forest fire. I was up in the Arctic in June, just as the, the forest fires were going through there. And, you know, the, there was a lot of carbon being released by the forest fires. I've got the math somewhere that per hectare of whatever pine forest burning releases this much carbon on average and prevents the future sequestration of this much carbon. So a forest fire is terrible. Um, but trees are vulnerable to, you know, frost, to worms. I also worked in the phytosanitary issue with wooden pallets. You know, bugs kill trees and create problems. So sequestration or storage of, of carbon. Carbon is a gas. How are you storing the carbon? Some of those systems will work, but some of them, Ted, are, you know, smoke and mirrors. Um, again, I don't like to criticize that. I just encourage people to not pollute so that we don't have to get an entire industry on the unpollution capturing that I, in my opinion, doesn't necessarily guarantee that you will keep that carbon forever. Again, you know, you're storing it somewhere in a tree and we all talk about, oh, we need forests and wetlands because it sequesters. Well, that's great until you've got a forest fire. And then all of a sudden your, your plan goes out the tube. If you're storing in a mine, as I say, if there's seismic activity, whoo, it's all leaked out and everything you've done is back haunting the heck out of us. Okay, good to hear your perspective. I like your comment too about the uh, some of the things are not real. If you go on the Air Canada website, you discover that uh, you know a flight across Canada for forty dollars you can cover your carbon costs. It's just absolutely yeah. ludicrous. There is yeah. no way. It's just greenwashing. Yeah. Hey, I, I and I I'm not opposing transit. But I even get upset with rapid transit that the bus is driven by a man who has to drive from his house to the bus terminal in the morning because there are no buses. He has to get on his bus. He has to deadhead out to the far end of the city to come in and pick up a whole lot of customers. And I know OC Transpo did this. That trip full of customers 
offset this much carbon by the need for that number of less cars. But then the bus has to turn around with nobody in it, and a bus is a high emitter, to drive way out to the far end of Ottawa to start picking up people again. They never counted. And then at the end of the day, his car is there. He has to drive his car home to wherever he lives. They only counted the peak. You know, it was not a life cycle or a total calculation. It was once we've got a bus full of people, this is how much carbon we're saving. And my question was always, how many times is a bus at 100% capacity utilization? You know, short of 100%, your number starts dropping. And, you know, if nobody's going downtown to work, I'm picking on Ottawa right now, you know, if nobody's going downtown to work, we still have the buses going out deadheading, 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 deadheading. You know, that poor driver is, is doing 20 trips a day in a bus, which emits an awful lot of carbon to pick up no passengers. Um, so, I mean, those are... We have to have rapid transit, assuming people go back to work. But you know, you, there is a holistic picture that we need to look at here. And that's why I focus on the individual, you, your home. What can you do? 82, 86% of your carbon emission from your home is from heating your house and heating your water and a little bit from space cooling. You know, that's where you should be focusing right now. Yes, incandescent bulbs, get rid of them. They're bad. They're wrong. You're, you're, you're inefficient fire or sorry um refrigerator your beer fridge in the basement they're all bad 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 but they're only 18 percent of your bad the other you know the 80 86 percent of your carbon is where you really should be focusing now you got me convinced bill i should take fewer showers <laughs> no please ted don't <laughs> <laughs> No other questions. Oh, come on. So again, uh, let me just do a very quick summary of what Net Zero Plus Canada is doing. We're trying to get standardized energy nomenclature in kilowatt hours. We're trying to get the energy from a heat pump recognized as dispatchable renewable energy. And I mean, without hiding or being coy about it, part of what we want is a production tax credit that if solar and wind get X cents per kilowatt hour for what they generate, why should a home with a ground source heat pump not get X cents per kilowatt hour of thermal for what they are producing? It is dispatchable, renewable energy. So it's a key issue. Um, and then we're trying to get into district energy. And uh, you know, so that's sort of where Net Zero Plus is trying to deal with the industry and the consumers. And then we're gonna launch into the regulators and politicians. But again, part of our campaign, 3millionhomes.info, is if you can install a ground source in a new build at the same cost as an air source in a renovation retrofit, why would you not put in ground source now? You've got a whole subdivision. Um, and very quick anecdote, I was involved early on, a subdivision east of Ottawa. The kid was a ground source dealer. The father was the developer. Kid said, Dad, can I borrow the backhoe this weekend? He dug a trench, installed ground source on a district loop in something like 13, 15 houses. The father was able to raise the cost of the house because they now are energy efficient. You're not going to need to pay this. And the kid made money because he sold 13 heat pumps to the, you know, to his father, basically. It was a win-win. And we were trying to advance that until the gas industry put an injunction saying, no, no, people have a right to a gas fireplace. So, you know. We lost that battle, but that was one of my irritations with Ottawa is the city was brain dead. That's one of the reasons I left Ottawa is I couldn't understand how they did not understand how they could affect change properly by doing it incrementally. They just, no, 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 it's, it didn't make enough money for them. So it wasn't gonna happen and they were being lobbied by vested interests that I won't name as the fossil fuel industry, but you know, um, that those are the battles that we're, we're fighting. Sorry, I lost connection there for a minute myself there, Bill, but I'm back. Oh. We're in overtime now. Um, if nobody has any other burning questions for Bill, um, I'd just like to thank him again for taking the time tonight to talk to us and really appreciate the presentation, Bill. Thank you for the opportunity. All right. All right. Good night, all. All right. All the best, guys.